Um, so hello, hello everybody. You may notice uh, on the video uh, feed that I'm standing here instead of seated and behind me is a screen and I'm also wearing a suit. Um, the reason is because I am right now on stage at Valparaiso University and if the audience members could just say hello, say Hi. hello. Um, and we should be able to see them in, in just a minute. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. Uh, I'm going to be turning my vision between the camera and the audience um, and face to face. Uh, I'm delighted to see you here today. We have a terrific guest who's uh, written a, her whole life, has done wonderful research on a vital, vital topic. And we're going to be talking about that. For years now, here in the Future Trends Forum, we've been covering questions of diversity, sometimes in questions of pedagogy, sometimes in questions of hiring. Uh, we've been talking about DEI as in diversity, equity, and inclusion for some time. And we've really wanted to have an expert who can talk about how to do this at the institutional level. This is why I am absolutely delighted to bring Daryl Smith. Uh, Smith is the author of a wonderful, wonderful book uh, that just came out in a fourth edition right now uh, from Johns Hopkins University Press, uh, looking at how to implement uh, DEI, specifically diversity across higher education. I have yet to read a book about diversity that is this in-depth that shows such an extensive mastery of all the literature that gives us so many practical guidelines while at the same time working through all the concepts of diversity. It, it's just an ex oh, it, this book should be on every provost, every president's desk. I can't recommend it enough. So in order to start talking about it, let me bring the author up on stage. Greetings, Professor Smith. Greetings, and <clears throat> thank you for those kind comments. Oh, uh, they are they are extremely, extremely wholehearted. Um, and uh, where have we found you today? You found me in Southern California, in Claremont. Oh, very good, very good. And you are so far not on fire, not flooded, uh, not washed out to sea or anything? And no earthquake yet. No earthquake yet? Oh, well, it's been, what, a couple of days since your last one? We didn't feel it, so we're, we're good. But just a few yeah. miles on the road, they did. You people are tough. You people are very, very tough. Um, and uh, the, the book you can find a link to, by the way, on the bottom left corner of the screen, you should see a kind of tan colored button. Uh, so if you press that button, it'll pop up a link to the, to the book. Um, Professor Smith, I'm gonna start calling you Daryl pretty soon um, in, in the spirit of California, Southern California. But let me just ask quickly, what are you gonna be working on for the next year? What lies ahead for you for the rest of 2024 and into 2025? Well, particularly because the book has just come out, I'm already and looking forward to working with campuses, diversity officers, professional organizations, uh, really on this really urgent moment. And what I would say is an opportunity to begin to frame diversity as an imperative for excellence. I think we are now ready because of the crisis and because of the changes that are going on to begin to understand how this is now a strategic opportunity for diversity. It's not just a bunch of programs. It's not something mm -hmm. we to do. And that's what's been the whole message of this work since 2009, the first edition. The research is very clear about that. And but it's been very hard for people to understand how this is an imperative for excellence in our mission. And um, we can talk a little bit more about how I see this. And um, I'm we will. working already with campuses and professional organizations to understand how this is mission central and how to be very strategic about this in language and communication. And um, I'm looking forward to that because it's very exciting, actually, as hard as this particular moment is with diversity, equity and inclusion. It's very exciting to have people see how this is an imperative for excellence. Mm, mm, it really is. And, th and that's one of the questions I wanted to ask you. Um, it, it sounds like you'll, you'll be consulting, you'll be doing more research, yes. you'll be, and yes. are you going to be teaching as well? No, I'm not teaching uh, anymore. I'm uh, retired from that. And uh, so I'm mostly just doing this work with uh, other organizations and campuses. Very good. I'm glad, I'm glad, to, uh, glad to do our bit in order to get the word out. Um, friends, if you're new to the Future Transform, what I'm going to do as facilitator is ask a couple of quick, easy, basic questions um, just to get the ball rolling. But from here on out, after those questions, after those answers, better, best of all, um, it'll be over to you for your questions and your comments. So uh, as we speak, as we think, as we talk together, and most of all, as you get a chance to listen to Professor Smith, think about what you'd like to ask. Um, the first question I wanted to ask uh, actually has to do with excellence. I was really struck by the um, by the argument throughout the book. It reminded me a bit of the Bollinger argument, but it's a but it was e much deeper, much stronger. That 
um, it's imperative to uh, for a university to strategically operationalize and embrace diversity, not just because it's the right thing to do, not just because it's a response to demographic changes, but specifically because it improves a university or college's everything. Uh, you you have a, a great case for how this improves uh, research, for example, by pointing out that um, having more women represented in biology, for example, actually lets us uh, uh, encourage people to actually test women, uh, half of the species, uh, on biological tests. You, you point out the, the importance of, uh, of having non-gender conforming people for uh, research in other fields and so on. I'm, I'm just wondering, this sounds like such, the minute you read that, you're like, oh, of course, this is a no-brainer. This is the best way to realize uh, the full research potential of, of higher education. And I'm, I'm wondering, how come I don't hear this argument all over the place? Uh, it seems like what you've, what you've done is show diversity as a superpower for colleges and universities. How come this isn't on everybody's lips? Well, I think because the history of this work is coming out of, of an important and unfinished business of uh, the unfinished business of race, gender, and class yeah. in our country. It's been yeah. framed that way. It's still unfinished. And so we've developed a language and a vocabulary that attended to that business. And um, it has a social justice argument embedded in it. But what we've learned from the research, what we've learned from when we look at institutional change, that's all well and good in terms of support for students or minoritized communities, as we want to say. Mm -hmm. But because of the changing demographics of our society, we're ready now to move to an entirely different question. And for me, the parallel is when we understood that the world was changing technologically. That was my other question I was going to ask you. Shoot, you stole it. All right, keep going. Keep going. And it's, you know, it's sometimes people think I'm crazy. I start my conversation about diversity with technology. Oh, and we understood the world was changing technologically. We didn't ask for the benefits of technology, although some people thought books would go away, libraries would close, the world would come to an end. But we knew the world was changing and we had to change with it. And we said about institutionally building capacity. In the old days, it was computers on people's desks, wires in the ceiling. Well, now you can't have a conversation about technology without talking about AI. We're constantly dealing with this. Well, our world has changed with respect to diversity, the demographically, mm -hmm. the country is changing mm -hmm. demographically at every level. Uh, and this is true internationally. So we are at that moment now where we're talking about what does it look like for higher education from a research point of view, from an educational point of view, to prepare people for a 21st century pluralistic society and a pluralistic society that works. And we have plenty of examples of diverse societies that don't work. So my yeah. thing has been, what yeah. do we know? What do we know? And it's pulling the research together. What do we know about societies, making societies work? And my own little tiny question is, if we can't make it work on our campuses, what hope is there for the world? And mm. it's, it's not a, mm values it's not about politics it is about it's about good science you know mm -hmm. what we know mm -hmm. in the old days we didn't teach good science when it came to gender i i was visiting a hospital and the person in cardiology brought me to talk about diversity and she said there'll be a doctor following you around and all he cares about is good science and i said good because all i care about is good science this isn't about values and the right thing it's about good science and the examples I used is a heart medication that it turns out now isn't very good for black men. Well, now why is that? Well, because there aren't enough black men in clinical trials to be sure it yeah. is, right? So I can give all kinds of examples. The latest example we had during the pandemic was the oximeter, the thing that measured oxygen yeah. in your blood. We've yeah. all had that little test. Yeah. Well, when oxygen was limited during the the federal government said if your oxygen level was 90, you didn't need limited oxygen. Mm -hmm. It turns out the oximeter elevates the oxygen level of people with darker skin, which meant people who couldn't breathe were being sent home to rest. Well, actually, they were being sent home in some cases to die. Now, to me, I'm not making this up. To me, this mm -hmm. is like health care. So I want people to understand that in virtually every discipline, the question is, what is good knowledge? What is good excellence? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you're a teaching institution, if you're a community college, I want to look at student success. What is our capacity to educate? And I want to know what is our capacity to educate all students to function 
in a diverse society, which means understanding the complexity of identities today. It's not just race, class, and gender anymore. Gender identity, sexual orientation, it's uh, immigration, the complexities within ethnic groups. I mean, there's all kinds of issues of complexity. So to me, this is obvious. And we get it with technology, we get it with globalization, and I want us to see that we need to get it with diversity. Well, well, thank you. That's a fantastic answer. And 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 you 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 stole my second question. I was going to ask, so I have to ask my third question now, um, which is: Do you are, are there any universities or colleges that are doing this work especially well that we can learn from? Well, I'm always asked that question, and I, what I would say is, in my work, there are campuses that are doing it better, and there are different aspects of it. So we've got mm. students mm. success. You can see campuses that are focusing in on retention and student success and thriving. You've got campuses at the graduate level with PhDs and diversity mm -hmm. and that. So for mm -hmm. student success, you're particularly looking at historically underrepresented communities and how well we're doing. Faculty hiring um, is a bit hit and miss. There's some, some progress there. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think increasingly you're, you're seeing campuses beginning to move as a strategic imperative from a mission. So I won't name places because what I see is, progress in different aspects. There are, to me, four dimensions of this, access and success, the climate. Too many campuses start with climate. I don't start with climate. There's the academic core, which I think is the last place that people are taking seriously. And then the mm. capacity building. And by climate, you mean the, the campus attitudes, not climate change? Right, yes. Good. Sorry, that, that, that's a subject that I that I focus yes. on that we've had sessions. I just want to make yes. sure it's clear. Um, well, thank you. Um, it, it sounds like we're kind of in the early days of, uh, of trying to have a, a campus renovation in this field then. What, what do you mean by campus? By trying to redesign and rethink uh, campuses strategically and operationally, it sounds like we're still in the early days of being able to do this, that um, you know, we have, we're, we're working at pieces of it, but no one's managed to actually fully oh. transform the campus. Well, and it's not, what, what has to happen is what traditionally happened in the early days is we approach this with what was called in the in an early project we were working with campuses on is projectitis. Mm. We mm. had mm. programs and projects. We had a problem, we had a program. And as the, the issues and one of the critiques of the word diversity is it became a laundry list of identities. And some of the historic issues, the unfinished business of race got lost in that. My way of framing this, and this is where I think people need to understand the complexity of identity, is inclusive mm. and differentiated. And it's, it's why mm. a whole chapter in the book is about identity, um, is inclusive. We can deal with race, class, gender, sexual orientation, uh, gender identity, all the, and in fact, increasingly because of some of the political stuff, rural. Um, you can add veterans is an increasing identity. Um, for some campuses now, the recent issues in October, Jewish. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. inclusive and differentiated. We've got the historic unfinished business of race. For gender identity, it may be non-binary bathrooms. We can be mm -hmm. different. We can deal with complexity. And we can say we can attend to complexity of different groups and what are the barriers to thriving in our institution. So I think that's the kind of um, collection of stuff. But the core here is why is this a strategic imperative? You know with technology, this isn't a simple thing. Right, but some imperative, and and here's an important thing: we've created chief diversity officers, but often they're the folks so frustrated because they're being told you do it, and I don't have to build capacity. But uh -huh. the reality is, uh -huh. I'm a dean or a department chair, just like technology. We have to build capacity, and believe me, when my phone gets an upgrade, I don't like it. <laughs> I'm not sure I was looking forward to learning about Shindig, but I'm glad I did, and now I have because it's I'm not. Good. I'm glad. It, it's not optional. Yeah. Right? It's Technology is not optional. And now AI is not going to be optional. We have to learn it. We have to understand what the disadvantages will be. We have to learn how to use it. Well, the same is true for diversity. And we have to see that that way. And then we have well, what I believe is important is chief diversity officers who help build mm -hmm. capacity, like our chief technology people. They're not running around teaching me how to get on Chindi. But if I need help, I can call my help desk. So they're helping build capacity. This is such a crucial, crucial part of your book is is, is making the argument about capacity. And I yep. love the technology parallel. That's that's such a vivid one. That really, really works. Um, also, when you're talking about the complexity of ideas, I mean, I, I really admired how you kept 
so much of that complexity going uh, throughout the book. Um, that's that's a lot of uh, a lot of lifting, um, and uh, in many ways a very dynamic field. Um, friends, I, I, I'd like to offer you the chance now to ask your questions. And, and I'd like to suggest there are no bad questions. One of the things that happens with this topic is people are afraid to ask questions. There are no bad questions, please. Thank you for saying that. Um, and again, if you're new to the forum technology, uh, you're to Shindig, just, you know, the bottom of the screen, uh, there's a white strip running along it with a few different buttons. Uh, and if you want to join us on stage, which is really easy, just make sure your mic is on and your camera is on and press the raised hand button and I'll bring you up on stage. And I promise it's clear. You don't have to have a beard to be on stage. Um, and if instead you would like to ask a, a text question, just hit the question mark button and type in your question or your comment and I'll flash it on the screen. Um, so while everybody is thinking, let me, uh, and, and typing away, um, I imagine steam coming out of people's ears as they're, as they're thinking. Uh, let me just ask my uh, Valparaiso University uh, friends here. Did any of you have a question you wanted to ask? And you could just say it out loud and I can, um, they might be able to hear it or I can repeat it out loud for you. They are stunned now. I just put them on the spot, literally. But um, would any of you like to put a question or uh, or have a comment? I guess this is um, unformed, but it's okay. um, she talked about this not being political. But at this current moment, DEI is so political yes. that I guess is there any way to talk about this that doesn't immediately uh, shut down the other side. Uh, quickly, Daryl, could could you hear that? Okay. Yes. It right now it is so political. Is there any way to deal with it? So one of the things this fourth edition I had, you know, the fourth edition um, began. Uh, I had the opportunity. To, the third edition ended just before George Floyd was murdered, and then the world changed after that. So I had an opportunity in this edition to deal with DEI, with the thought that maybe we were going to be able to deal with structural racism, the pandemic. I mean the book really was able to deal with this. And what I would say is, um, this is a moment, particularly in certain parts of the country. I mean, you, different parts of the country can deal with these issues differently. I'm in California. I can still talk about, use three letters, but my feeling is those of us who've been doing this work for decades have used some of this language internally as if we all know what it means. And that even in our own campuses, we've lost a good chunk of people who really don't, aren't engaged. And we can't have that anymore. It'd be like if we allowed half of our faculty and staff to say, well, I don't, I'm supportive of diversity, but I don't have to do it. Well, that's not an option with technology. And it can't be an option with people on our campus because it's in our classrooms, it's, it's everywhere. So I think the question for me is to frame this in the language of our institutions. So when I'm working on camp with campuses, say in the South now, I go to the mission of that institution and its language. And I have had no trouble engaging with these issues, equity issues, using the language of the institution. So for example, in, a in Alabama, a public institution, which is very much under scrutiny right now, mm -hmm. about serving the people of, Calif of Alabama, I say, good, who are the people of Alabama? Well, you get a very racially rich population diversity in Alabama. So which people are you serving? How well are you serving them? Mm. What is the, So a black maternal mortality, if you're a health provider, is an issue. So I can deal with all the issues I want to deal with in terms of equity, dealing with the language of the mission of the institution. And that's what I would suggest. Start with the language of the institution and the context and not start with DEI. We've been starting with DEI and trying to push it into our institutions. And I'm suggesting the reverse. Start with our institutions and its language. It's never worked to go to MIT and Caltech and talk about social justice, even though people may feel that this mm -hmm. is the right thing to do. Caltech's mission is the development of science. So why is this a strategic imperative for Caltech? Well, it turns out the scientists and the engineers believe that diversity is a strategic imperative for their fields. And they have very eloquent arguments for it. So we don't have to try pushing it in we have to start with the language of the institution. So that would be my answer. Start with the institution's own mission and language and see where diversity is in it. It's not failed me yet. Well, thank you. The, the, so first off, if you're new to the forum, this is, a, this is what we want to have happen. Um, both we want to have a brilliant guest and a brilliant questioner having an exchange. Uh, and that question on, on the chat, people said that was a question that they wanted to ask. Um, we did have a, a quick question, uh, if I could. This is a, a follow-up from um, 
from something you said, Daryl. Uh, this is uh, uh, from uh, Yvonne, and she asks, uh, what is the fourth metric used to identify how campuses are doing? Academic core, access to success, campus climate, and? Uh, institutional um, viability. And in that one, I have faculty hiring policies and such, but particularly Great. faculty hiring retention, staff hiring and retention. It's the capacity Thank side. Thank you. Thank and you. And in the book, I list sort of the key metrics you would use if you wanted to just go in and say, where are we now as an institution? And I would encourage all of you who are affiliated with institutions to ask, disaggregated, particularly by race and gender, just use those two. And that gets at the historic issues always as race and gender get intersecting. Where are we on that? Oh, thank you. And and by the way, what Yvonne just did, thank you for the question, Yvonne, uh, was uh, that's an example of a Q&A box question. So um, just you know, hit that question mark button and type or hit that question mark button, type in the question and I can I can play it on the screen for everyone to see. Um, and you had a question. I, I want to say Alan. Is that right? I'm Bob. Bob, why did I call you Alan? I don't know where that came from. Bob, please save me. So would you advocate for me to suggest that you would take it to the extent to which you would embed the language and the learning objectives of the coursework? In the curricula at the university is that is that would it that would that to that extent would you suggest that we would do that dei repeat the question about where yeah, we're yeah. that we would that we would embed the language of dei into the uh, learning objectives for the individual coursework within the curriculum at the university that no. level of specificity See, what I worry about is what people often do is they inject DEI into something. It sits there like a DEI. I would actually ask the question, given our um, the, the objectives of the course, where is diversity in this? Where are we talking about the, and often it's population diversity. If it's a course that deals at all with human mm -hmm. beings, where are we dealing with? So for example, I was working with a nursing school and they were already overwhelmed with the essentials of nursing that talks about all kinds of things they've already got. And they had no room for injecting DEI in. I said, don't do that. Deal with population diversity. To what degree are you helping nursing students understand one, the complexity of identity of people that they'll be dealing with? And how are your readings when they do a lit review of their graduate students, who's being studied and who's not being studied? In other words, it's not adding DEI as a thing. And I would say at this moment, in most parts of the country, those three letters, if you're gonna use words, use words, not letters. Um, but it's more taking the course and saying, how is diversity, equity, and inclusion in the content of this curriculum? So if you gave me an example of a course, I might give you an example of how I would inf kind of look at how it's infused. So Bob teaches a class on ethics and computers, right? Right. Oh, uh, that's perfect. So the question is facial recognition software. How do algorithms work? See, I want to know about the barriers or how these the equity issues in facial rec in in uh, data analysis algorithms, facial recognition. It's not DEI, but it is what we're learning about how how this great thing we're developing with uh, algorithms, how uh, you know, the problems with facial recognition software, what we're learning about how AY works and how it uses and what the equity issues are there. That's right. where I would put the content, not DEI. I would just put the lens of equity through there. So would it be appropriate, one of the things I've done in my coursework is I have my students view coded bias, the video coded mm. bias. Yeah. And yes. I make, I make that as part of the actual course. Absolutely, that's it, perfect. Thank you. How does how does that go over, by the way? How does it work for the students? Um, they're fascinated by it, especially because it came out of work by a postgraduate work by a, a student yeah. uh, who yeah. discovered discovered it through the sampling, and they they get, they they identify with the entire the the, uh, the the thesis of the entire video, and then they get dragged into it. And and uh, again, I'm dealing with IT professionals that, as part of a master's program, mm. and so mm. this is typically something very new to them. And, and, about, and this oh, is to me about excellence, right? How do we train professionals in IT without not preparing them for the limitations of this aggregation of data analysis without showing them some of the limits of this development of data that's got embedded bias in it? If we don't, this is not excellent preparation because what we're doing is replicating inequities in our data analysis. And if they're not conscious of it, 
we're just replicating inequities in pretty large scale terms. So what you're doing is essential. So in my institution, we have a big program in IT and they were doing a hiring. And I said, are you gonna make sure that you ask any of the future faculty that are being hired, how much familiarity they have with the embedded inequities in some of this um, work in a IT? That's all, so you're, you're right on. Okay. Thank well, you. We, we build on that. I, I also have to watch Crime versus Computer right after that. Which one? On PBS, the Crime versus Computer. I don't video. know. Don't know. We build, on, we build on top of that. Well, thank, well, thank you. you. I appreciate your feedback. Well, that's a great question. Um, Wonderful. And, uh, and, and it's Darryl, thank you. Oh, perfect okay. example of this is not DEI stuck in. You see? It's mm -hmm. thinking about what are the embedded inequities that have emerged in virtually every discipline. I mean, when could you? You know, I'm not talking about ethnophysics here, but it's where is this an imperative and what's missing? There was a journal of oncology recently that was looking at what do we know about chemotherapy and Latinas in breast cancer research? And it turned out there's not much research on how chemotherapy interacts with various ethnic populations. Oh, this no. Is, this is good medicine. Yeah. This is not DEI yeah. per se. No, it's actually serving patients. Um, yes. Thank you, Bob, for the great question and the great examples. Um, and and uh, Daryl, thank you. These are these are terrific answers. We have a, a follow-up question, actually, um, which uh, uh, takes this uh, a little bit further on the disciplinary side. This is from Laurie Levine. What about a chemistry class? Our chemistry instructor says you can't put DEI in an introductory chemistry class. So I'll have to think about this. So I have a good example in chemistry. So l let me just say here, that I don't, I don't need to pr propose ethnophysics. I do know that from a Native American perspective, you could, okay? But I don't want to go that far. I mean, there's all kinds of uh, things in the physical world you could introduce Native mm. perspectives. But what, yeah. I, what I would say is this is where student success, gateway courses, who's succeeding and who's not succeeding. This is where that very important mm. dimension of student success is, so organic mm -hmm. chemistry as the mm -hmm. gateway to pre-med. Organic chemistry as the gateway to medicine, PhDs and the STEM fields. I mean, the STEM fields now are um, hugely central in diversifying in the STEM fields for our country, for the future, for our own capacity as a country. And, organ and chemistry is one of those places that people are looking and organic chemistry is one of those things. So Chemistry 101 may be one of those places where people start getting excited about chemistry. So there's pedagogy. How do we get students engaged? We've got this. I see this. I was a math major. So I see this in um, mm -hmm. introductory statistics courses. Mm -hmm. It's so much that, I mean, you could use examples in statistics, but it's mostly who thrives. I have a colleague who uh, most of my doctoral students were first generation women of color who were college administrators. They were mature people. Mm -hmm. And you put it on the board and they would nearly pass out. And I had a colleague who was known that he could teach statistics to Iraq and they would do advanced multi-level statistics for their dissertations because wow. teaching was such that they could do it. Mm -hmm. so, he, so I would say the issue for introductory chemistry is more who's succeeding, who's thriving, who's, who thinks they can, who's being told they can and not maybe you should yeah. think about switching majors. So it's all those pre-med students that start thinking they're going to take chemistry and find themselves moving out mm. that I'm watching for in infrared. Mm. Oh, that's a, that's a wonderful answer. That, that's that. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, I was called. I was called to a campus to do a study on which are the gateway courses where underrepresented students, in particular, were were leaving. And I said, yeah. you know darn well which are the gateway courses. Uh. <laughs> and and. The capacity of the institution is in the capacity of the institution to teach students well. It's not the background characteristics of the students. It's the capacity of the faculty to teach students to succeed in those courses. With And this chapter on student success in my book, I summarize with three things. There's a three-legged stool in that chapter. High expectations. So we're not dumbing anything down. You know, I'm a, I'm a pretty vigorous faculty member, and my students knew this high expectations, and we're not dumbing anything down. Belief in students' capacity, even when they don't believe in themselves, apropos of math and science, and the support necessary to get them there. So for my students, when they were doing their doctoral work, often with advanced statistics, it was a screen that had me on the 
on their screen with si se puede. Yes, you can, right? Nice. High nice. expectations, belief in students and the support necessary to get them there. So those are important things for student success. Oh, thank you, thank you. Uh, we have a couple more questions coming from the uh, online audience, um, as always. And uh, here's one that has to do with kind of a uh, meso level uh, discussion on the campus. Uh, this is from Jenny. We have an internal DEI, oh, sorry, it looks like DEIA discussion group that has been going on for a few years. We're always looking for topics for discussion. I want to keep the discussions relevant and educational. Any ideas? Well, are you trying to discuss from the point of lear learning or are you looking at your institution and seeing how you're doing? Oh, that, that's a great. That, that's a great answer um, or a clarification. Jenny, if, if uh, you could either um, respond with another Q&A box or you could join us on stage if you like. Uh, if you want to join us on stage, just click the raised hand button. Um, and uh, you can you can tell that uh, we're, we're pretty nice. Um, so while she's trying that out, um, uh, let's see. There we go. And what's great about this, uh, Daryl, by the way, that the people here uh, at Valparaiso, they're actually seeing the uh, the back end administrative window of this. So they get to see how the sausage is made, which is which is great fun, um, at least for me. Uh, let's see, Jenny. Hello, Jenny. Hi. How fun. Oh, Duke. Hi, you're <laughs> not too far from us. Hello. Hi, thank you for inviting me on stage. Uh, just started. Yeah. Um, each year, two of our staff people in our, our learning innovation and lifetime education department lead a DEIA for accessibility uh, discussion group where we've talked about everything from our identities, our names. Um, of course, I'm going to blank on all of the subjects we've covered this year, but um, I want to do a good job. And of course, I have a, another person who, who works with me um, just looking for ideas. And it's that's you know, you answered my question with a tough question. It's definitely, you know, for our own educational purposes, we want to feel well informed and what's going to help. And for me, sometimes that means what's on my Instagram and who am I following and where's the diversity there. But um, so that's one idea. Well, the two topics, you know, I, I've, I've challenged myself when I started writing these this book, the first editions. What were the, t and this was for students, but it's really for professional development as well. What are the two learning outcomes you would want if you could only have two? <laughs> and, you know, I'm an academic, I could list many. And here were the two learning outcomes that I would wish. And one is the complexity of identity. And then there's a whole chapter in the book on that. Because it turned out, and I didn't expect that to be so important in the work that I was doing, but it turned out it's really important and it's complicated. And this, so I think a discussion about what is, what is identity and the complexity of it that deals with uh, intersectionality, asymmetry, uh, context, would be a wonderful discussion because one of the things that I think is an extremely exciting thing to do in a group is have people list all their identities. Um, I've When I've done that, you usually get 12 or 13. Um, and then yeah. what context, what pops up in which context. So the complexity of identity, I think, is one. And the other is the embedded uh, visible and inv invisible barriers that people experience. And I think it's a really um, it's an insightful discussion to have what barriers people see. And from a political point of view, for those of you who are listening, one of the things you begin, if you're in a political environment where just starting with a race discussion just is not the place to start. I've started sometimes with a hearing discussion. Because one of the things I've become aware of is sometimes people are not thinking about hearing loss. And those people who have had hearing loss um, are very sensitive to that. And so you can start with a, um, a barrier that's more accessible. It doesn't have to fight the political charge. And get mm -hmm. people context of what are the barriers people experience in our institution that we may not be conscious of. So I would, I would, I think those two topics could be very rich in a discussion group to highlight when we talk about diversity, the complexity and the barriers. I'm glad you mentioned that because yes, Ali at Duke is where I work, and ageism was one of our topics. And well, I'm so glad, I'm so glad you work you. at Ali. That's a that's a great program. I uh, love thank it. you, thank you, Jenny, uh, thank for you. being here. Uh, Daryl, we had a, a previous guest who does work in accessibility, um, uh, named Mike Johnson. And he had this great idea, this great prompt for audiences. He would talk to publishers and faculty and say, would you decide 
not to sell your books or to make your syllabi available to people with red hair. And they would say, God, no, that's, that's, that, that's terrible. We wouldn't do that. And they said, well, why don't you do that for people who have visual impairments? Uh, anyway, um, so I think politically, what I would say about communication, which it turned out to be more important in this fourth edition, is mm -hmm. using typical language for diversity. And it's communicating with people who feel good about it, whether it's anti-racism as the first line, you know, entry, mm -hmm. depending on your audience. There are so many ways in which you can get people to begin to engage the issue of barriers. It, what's interesting to me is even the most right-wing legislators who are doing anti-DEA, DEI, mm -hmm. have mm -hmm. exempted ADA from their language. So it's okay to do ADA because they get uh, all of the That's so interesting. So they've explicitly, so use ADA as an example of a BR and make sure people understand that what we're talking about here has nothing mm -hmm. to do with merit. This mm -hmm. is about excellence. And you, we have to help people understand that this, this mm -hmm. old notion about diversity and excellence in conflict is quite the contrary. This is about excellence. Mm -hmm. And we have to keep Thank handling you. that and pick good examples. That's why I use the oximeter and the, mm -hmm. uh, you know, these kind of classic examples just say, this is not excellent. If you know your facial recognition software doesn't recognize a black face or doesn't recognize Barack Obama as anything yeah. but a, this is not excellent. So I think we just have to enter with who our audience is and find ways to get people. Oh, that's what you're talking about. That's that's terrific. Thank you, and and thank you uh, for the great question, uh, Jenny. I appreciate you coming up on stage. Um, and uh, again, for everybody else, this is. Um, this is how we work. This is how our conversation goes. Um, Daryl, we have one question that I, I can't show on the screen, but I need to read out loud. It's going to come in through the chat. Uh, this is from Katie Evans. This says, I like the suggestions about using language within institutional missions, within given disciplines or uh, courses, but I'd be curious if you'd recommend a step further, demonstrating the interconnections of learning benefits of using broader language. Oh, I'm sorry. And she continues, uh, demonstrating the interconnections of learning uh, and relating, to, for example, to NACE career competencies, et cetera, connecting student outcomes to student job preparedness. Oh, I would, you know, I'm, there are people who uh, don't want to connect these things to things, but, you know, if I'm thinking about preparing all students for leadership in this world, absolutely. I mean, if that's what you're talking about is preparing students for leadership in this society. I don't know how we wouldn't be th urgently thinking about. I think, in fact, I've often said to career planning offices, we need to talk about what are the skills people need to be CEOs in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if that's what you're talking about, absolutely. Um, how, do you, you. how do you need to understand, there's a whole literature that I've referenced in, in the book about inclusive leadership and what you need to know about your own identity and how what it means to lead diverse teams. Um, there's just a lot of rich work on that. And I think our students are um, not prepared to engage that they even get defensive. Part of the issue is that so much of our early work was personal with race, for example, mm. about racism. So you immediately have white people going, but I'm not a racist. Mm -hmm. if, if we're talking here about institutions and embedded structures and mm. Mm. issues of personal bias and implicit bias, yeah all of that, which we need to address, but we need yeah. to help people understand that this is something that they under, need to understand to be a white person in the society, to what it means to be um, black in this society, what it means every time there's a George Floyd, as we've had recent experiences almost every day in the newspaper recently about uh, shootings. Um, what does it mean to be a white leader uh, or uh, any leader? What does it mean to be within a group and the complexities within groups? Uh, we have uh, issues of um, diversity within racial communities. Uh, we need to help people understand that and what their position is and how they develop um, teams that work well together. Um, there's mm -hmm. a, and so I've talked about that in the book and uh, there's a wonderful reference uh, in there about the golden triangle of shared goal, mm -hmm. diversity. I mean, if you're really gonna maximize the benefits of diversity, shared goal, diversity, and then trust. So how are we in our mm. planning, in our continuing education, helping people develop that kind of good sauce 
to bank the benefits of diversity. Sometimes people use athletic teams to do that. Watching the Olympics, you might have um, observed some of that. So I think this is continuing education, career planning, absolutely, if that's what you were referencing. Did I speak to your question? Katie, how did we do? Let us know in the chat um, and, uh, and and let me let me know how it goes. Um, Daryl, we're we're coming up on the end of the hour with with amazing swiftness, um, and so I don't want sure I want to make sure people get a chance to ask questions. Uh, we've got a couple in the pipeline that uh, that are really okay. good. This is one from uh, 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 Carla Gainham, and Carla, if I mispronounce your last name, please please correct me. Uh, and she asks, what are some suggestions for those of us who are not part of strategic planning or leadership to promote this subject, if the institution might not really support it? Well, I think this has implications at every level. So one is at your own level, where are you? But the other is, I think the more you can use the language of the institution, usually when we talk about don't really support it, it's because we're saying they don't really support diversity. So be strategic. Look at the institution. What I do when I visit a campus is look at the institution's own strategic plan and demonstrate how, whether it's an enrollment initiative, let's say you've got enrollment declines, um, and try to see how diversity, you don't have to even use the word, is contingent on doing diversity well. And that might mean the enrollment management, it might be something else. So I would, if you want to get involved at the institutional level, be very strategic, try not using the D word, and see where it fits in the strategic imperatives for your institution. And in mm -hmm. addition, kind of work at your own level as well to see where that fits. And we could, you know, if you wanted to email me with particulars, feel free. Um, but that's, I think, when you say don't support it, it's usually because someone has said don't support diversity. And that's what we see all over the country. People give this service and then they want you to do it or the diversity person to do it. And they go on. Yeah. With, but every institution right now, particularly enrollment across the country is a huge issue. So I just mm -hmm. have disaggregated student success data. And that gets you right into the middle of why are students leaving, not succeeding. And that's mm -hmm. a money issue. And money speaks. Uh, it, it does indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good question, too. Um, let me ask uh, from our table of Valparaiso. Uh, any questions or comments here? Okay. Well, you have, you have one more chance to think of some, especially the bearded guy, because the bearded guy has to be smarter. That's just his, his thing. Um, but uh, speaking of which, we have a question from our dear friend um, out in uh, California State, uh, Monterey Bay, George huh? Station, and uh, not too far from you. And we bring up George on stage. Hello, sir. Hi, neighbor. Your audio, your audio is off. Uh, no sound, uh, George. Hey. Yeah, I don't think you can hear us either. Um, do you want to just uh, relaunch your screen? Oh, I'd hate to miss Monterey Bay. Well, especially you want to hate to miss George because George always asks fantastic questions. Uh, nothing yet. Nothing yet. Um, okay. Well, let me let me take you off stage for a second and see uh, see if Wes can help you, and then um, we have another one to talk about. Um, but I don't want to miss George because he's awesome. Uh, okay. We have uh, uh, more questions coming in, and uh, and this is one from uh, uh, our dear friend and former guest and uh, great writer and great thinker, uh, Steve Ehrman. Uh, in Maryland. And Steve is just someone I always turn to for questions with campus strategy and operations. Uh, Steve asks, one could argue that for many STEM faculty and others, there is an important paradigm shift in order to engage with the practices you recommend. If you agree, is that a big ask? Do you want to say what, which aspect of the paradigm shift? Yes. Yeah, uh, Steve, if, if you want to, uh, if you want to just join us on stage, click the raised hand if you want to follow that up, or you can type in uh, uh, another another question for that. Um, and uh, oops, in Let fact, he does. I can um, try to say this about STEM. When I I was asked to go to a camp, oh God, let me. Oh, I think I think we've got him. Hello, oh. Steve. Hiya. Can you hear me? Yeah. Perfectly. Good to see you. Okay. The I was trying to. Anyway, there was a word limit that kept me from get, giving the answer to your question. What I'm thinking about is the belief of many inside and outside universities. Um, the people inside universities are more often the STEM fields than not, that 
the ability of the student to learn um, and to get gain from a college education is pretty much dictated by the way they were uh, at the point they entered college. Ah, yes. Um, so you can you can have a meritocracy. There's a almost yeah. ordered list. Any, oh, any teaching technique that that um, upends that list yes. uh, is is by definition suspect. Yes, because it must involve um, lowering standards, no matter what it looks like objectively. Yes. Yeah. Well, one of the things that I did in one of my early studies was testing, because of course that's been one of the big things, and there was a whole literature on you know the tests are the best predictors. And I'm an empiricist by definition. You know, to me, there's an empirical question there. And I used to say in my doctoral seminars, if the SAT predicts student success, it would be unethical to disregard it. And my students who were committed to diversity and social justice would be horrified that I would say such a thing. And I'd say it's unethical. If, if I'm going to bring students in with low SAT scores and commit them to failure, then it would be unethical. So I set about doing a retrospective study of tests. So I got national data, and it's in the book. It's reported in the book. This is great stuff. On graduation, disaggregated by race and gender. And then I got some institutions, including some very elite science institutions, uh, on honors and graduation and grades. And then I went back and looked at their SAT scores. And you should see what that said. And the bar graphs are pretty impressive. So what I wanted to do was debunk the assumption, because what's happened is this was a best predictor with traditional science, you know, regression methods. It wasn't a very good predictor, but we had no variables that measured the institution's education. What we know is good education matters. And all the research says that. So we need to kind of unpack some of this stuff. Good education matters. So that's why my three pillars here are very important. High expectations. What I'm saying, what I'm looking at is not what you need to teach them, on which we agree completely, but whether they will learn from that. In other words, when we're talking about faculty or politicians or um, who have the, the notion that the student's mind, the student's potential is fixed, and right. that's a fixed belief in their mind, right. can they become malleable? Uh, in a way that works most of the time and then begin to see things another way. Oh, you're, the, you're talking about the faculty yeah. change. So, you know, you've got Carol Dweck's uh, article about malleability of learning. And mm -hmm. part of this issue is accountability and who gets assigned to teach those courses, particularly the gateway courses. And I think institutions have a lot to say about hiring. And this is where hiring and people's experience and success in working with diverse populations matters a great deal as long as we do the same old same old in terms of what is the expertise we needed as our student body gets more and more diverse do we not care about whether people have experience and success in working with diverse populations or do we think it's okay when only 10 percent of the students succeed organic chemistry and i think that's part of it because as i said to you about my colleague he's not diminishing quality and everybody knows that so the part of the message to the faculty is and then you have teaching and learning centers which will help people learn what to do, but again, not lowering standards. So we have to keep repeating that because some of the older faculty keep thinking that. So we have to keep repeating high expectations, high expectations. But but it's also an institutional culture. The old days of look to the right, look to the left, half of you won't be here is no longer a measure of success, particularly in campuses. And I don't know how many of you are experiencing this, some of you don't, where enrollment is an issue. Well, you can't keep dealing with enrollment from an admissions point of view. Retention is an issue. <laughs> yep. You know, and a lot of institutions in our country don't get to pick and choose. So retention is a huge issue, and you don't want to be lowering standards and graduating students who can't do what you need them to do. So I think this whole issue of the culture and the mission and high expectations and then hiring faculty and helping faculty who want to learn mm -hmm. and, and rewarding that. Steve, we, we, we've, we've got to keep moving. But I want to say thank you for that great question. Great question. Uh, this is really a mindset uh, change that's so, so important. It's an institution uh, accountability change too. Yep. All of this. Uh, thank you again, Steve. Let, let me bring up George, and make sure that we've got uh, uh, all the uh, uh, all the audio up. And uh, George, where have, we, where have we found you today? Okay, um, I'm actually in uh, Pacific Grove, so the Monterey Peninsula. 
and, um, and it's uh, during uh, our uh, annual car week, so it's messier than usual here. <laughs> and so I'm ensconced at home, okay, while car week's going on. Um, oh, good. Okay, so uh, uh, um, Gerald, let me uh, thank you for saying disaggregation multiple times today because our, our chancellor's office is great at giving our provosts URM data, and then we have to ask for it to be disaggregated. Absolutely. When it when we are smart enough to ask for that, right? So it's back on the campuses to say, yeah, but what about disaggregated? I think we're breaking them into the habit, but I'm not sure yet. So thank you for saying using that term. Uh, first of all, um, that wasn't my my real question coming in, but I want to thank you for that. Uh, the real question coming in is post George Floyd, post all the nice statements that appeared on every campus website about anti-racism and so on, we seem to be in a lull now. Um, you're the first person I've heard mention George Floyd publicly um, in some time. So uh, obviously campuses are thinking in other terms and we've got austerity, we've got layoffs, we've got things that I'm gonna say take away one of the legs of your stool, namely trust. So we've got some stuff going on, including, you know, uh, is like, is this stuff worth worth the work we put into it? And I'm wondering um, how we can maybe reinvigorate or regain some lost momentum. Um, if you have a California example, that's great, but if not, anywhere. Well, I think the discouragement is very real and um, and the disaggregation is huge. And, uh, you know, your chancellor is Millie Garcia and uh, um, she and I have worked together for years. And I think, you know, when yeah. you look at the data, it's critically important. Yeah. And, oh. and I should not, excuse me, I'll note that she has been around, uh, she's quote the new chancellor, you know, even though she's been around for a year and was in another uh, part of the system. Uh, um, so I'm going to say that prior to her arrival, there was a lot of aggregated URM data. Right. Yeah. No, she, she gets that. Mm -hmm. So I think the question, you know, the, the ultimate question is, this has been on the backs of the same people. And the one thing I would say about those of us who've been doing the work and those who bear the burden of it, who are folks of color, is uh, taking care of self. I, I've never talked about self-care as much mm -hmm. as I have now, and I think that's an issue. I do think this is a time to use different language. And I think in terms of California, because of all that's going on, the disaggregated data the, pub, the headlines about success. We know, I mean, California is a majority minority state. So all the indicators of success, faculty hiring and retention are critical. I wanna look at those data and hope that you've got campuses because the mission is there, the serving the public of California. I mean, those are supposedly easy things. Mm -hmm. And then finding who are the allies that are gonna surround you. So you're not alone in doing it because it, you know, on the backs of the same people at this point can't be. So what are the issues in your own campus that really are driving you into the wall? And that may be faculty. May be student, I don't know where, where student success, for example, at Monterey Bay, is it student success or is it the faculty being drained? Is it retention of faculty? I would look at the key indicators and say, where are the issues? Is it through the provost? Because I think that's what I would do to articulate the core places to function because California is a different East. Mm -hmm. And I think there's more potential to move in California in one way, but we're at a very discouraging time given what's gone on nationally. But I think, um, I think California, there's no more imperative in terms of serving the people of California and a healthy democracy. I mean, we're seeing that right now. And yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you. And, and I think it's retention of uh, black faculty and staff yes. uh, is really a toughie. And I will uh, um, say, I, I can't say that it's across the system, but I can speak for my own campus. And well, and I would go on that because what I learned, I did the faculty study, right? And in our study of campuses, we had a lot of reasons. They don't come, they won't stay, we can't pay them enough. And they're, and what we interviewed all the black faculty at these various campuses who left and they were crying toxic environments, being the token, et cetera. So I would focus, you know, and if you need to get somebody from outside to do it, um, this is unacceptable. And when uh, UCLA had the headlines of how many black students there were at UCLA, this cost attention. So in California, a little headline about who's getting lost and they're not mm -hmm. getting because they get better jobs somewhere else. Those are myths. 
So the debunking the myths of why faculty retention is an issue is a good lever for you. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Thank you for this conversation. George, thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you for the great question. And, uh, and, and, and my, Daryl, I, I have to say, I'm, I'm afraid we are we're past the end of the hour, so we, we need to uh, wrap things up. Um, you've just been a fantastic guest. Uh, I mean, I was telling people how awesome your book was, but this, the, your, your answers are so thoughtful and so deep uh, and so useful. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, what's what's the you. best way for people to keep up with you in, in this work? Well, I, I'm, I'm trying to do uh, LinkedIn and stuff, but uh, you can also okay. just email me if you've got, because these are very particular institutions and I find myself as you yeah. know, you're wanting to know what the yeah. situation is, so it's not generic. Um, but the book really does take different institutional types and say, you know, in this kind of an institution, this. So I, I try to make it very institution type specific, um, but feel free to email me if you've got particular kind of questions you want to engage. And um, I'm on Thank LinkedIn, but I'm not an active, I've got Instagram too, but I'm not, not as good as I should be. I might get better. Maybe Brian, you'll help me. Well, that, that tells us how we can find you. And, uh, um, and thank you again. Well, uh, thank good you. Luck. Really this fall, we, we we need you. We need you out there, and um, I'll and have to circle you. back to you in a year or so and, and get more. Uh, thank you so much. But but don't go away, friends. Uh, let me just let uh, keep you posted with where we're headed next. Uh, so if you want to talk more about these I issues of of uh, building capacity for diversity and campuses and all the different ways we've discussed, just use the hashtag FTTE. And uh, you can do this on all the socials from Twitter, LinkedIn, Mastodon, Threads, and Blue Sky, not to mention my blog. Um, if you'd like to uh, look into our previous sessions, just go to our archive at tinyurl.com slash FDF archive. Uh, if you'd like to look ahead to our sessions, which touch on diversity as well as other issues, everything from decolonization to enrollment to uh, reforming grading, just go to the forum website forum.futureofeducation.us. Uh, once again, thank you all for the excellent questions. Thank you for thinking with us on a difficult subject. Thank you to Valparaiso University for hosting us today and for our five guests. All right, you guys are terrific. Thank you. And uh, everybody, take care, be safe, and we'll see you next time online. Bye-bye.